you very much, Igor, for the wonderful talk. Uh, so Professor Pikoski has been talking about uh, connection between quantum uh, mechanics with uh, gravity. So I actually have a similar uh, talk here. I'm going to talk about connection between quantum information, quantum computation with optics. So that's another type of connection here. So um, as we know that uh, in the last century, two of the most uh, successful and most important fields that has been developed that has changed our life uh, completely is uh, quantum science, mostly developed in the 1920s and, and then computer science uh, since the 1930s. So we know that uh, all the devices or uh, products that we use every day now, for example, electronically or uh, uh, optically, magnetically, or chemically, even lots of devices, all as a result of uh, quantum mechanics. Otherwise, they, these devices won't exist at all. And of course, we know for computer science, uh, all those computers, laptops, or, or smartphones, or, or robotics, or now uh, artificial intelligence, or uh, cannot exist if there is no computer science. So there was the uh, great success of the last century uh, for those two major uh, important fields of science. Uh, at the 21st century now, these two fields are starting to merge and create a new field that we hear every now and then these days they're called quantum information and quantum computation. And for short, uh, many people call it uh, quantum information science. So uh, mostly, for this new field of quantum information, quantum computation, and it can, can, contains two major categories. One, one is called quantum information that deal with uh, quantum communications uh, and quantum cryptography or quantum sensing or lots of information processing. And the, the other part as from the title, we know that it's quantum computation. So we see nowadays uh, those big companies, IBM, Google, Microsoft, so they already have, have jumped into this field. Maybe at least for 10 years now, they are um, trying to build quantum processors now uh, using different types of physical systems like superconducting, uh, trapped ions, uh, and many other uh, physical systems. So uh, I assume that uh, the audience here has already heard a lot about the good things about quantum information computation, and I'm not going to reiterate that here. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the challenges that uh, we're facing in, in this field. So this is a criterion called uh, David Chinzo criteria uh, that proposed in uh, by David David Chinzo in uh, the year 2000 about his understanding of, uh, of the essential elements that the quantum system has to, uh, has to have uh, in order to realize quantum computation. So uh, these are all of the elements he listed. So I, I just highlight a few of them and try to explain a little bit. So the first one is a long relevant decoherence time, much longer than gate operation time. So don't worry about that, that some techno uh, technology, uh, uh, technical uh, words there. But it basically says that quantum systems are fragile. It's, uh, it's, it will inevitably interact with its environment and the noise effect on the quantum systems are very severe. So it will very easily destroy the quantum system. So one criterion is that uh, you have to create a quantum system to, to uh, maintain its quantum coherence for a long time. That is to say, to get rid of those you know, environmental effects as much as possible. The second thing here is that a qubit specific measurement capability. So that really states that one has to have the capability uh, uh, to manipulate, to, to technically to, to measure or to, uh, to operate uh, on a single qubit system. So that can be a photon, a, an electron or an atom. So those are very small uh, particles and things that uh, you know, we, we have to have very, very delicate techniques in order to fully manipulate those systems. And the third one is, says that, uh, of course, the scalability issue that, uh, of course, if you want to do some meaningful information processing or meaningful computation tasks, you have to uh, need not just one uh, single quantum 
qubit or qubit, you, ne you will need hundreds and thousands of them. So then you have to have the ability to, you know, have those qubits to talk coherently and have to, to, to manipulate them in a collective way. There are other two technical uh, criteria that uh, I won't mention them at all, but those are relatively, you know, uh, all the uh, quantum systems, if they were to use to realize a quantum computation, they have to satisfy. Now, over the last 30 years or so, there's a lot of uh, uh, proposals for using different types of, uh, um, different types of uh, uh, physical systems as a candidate for a quantum qubit. So at least, uh, uh, there are at least 20 different types. I just name a few, uh, superconducting circuits, uh, trapped ions, photons, electrons, quantum dot, and nitrogen vacancy centers. There are a lot more of them. So as you can see, the reason why there is so many uh, physical systems proposed is because none of them are ideal, none of them are perfect. So none of them satisfy all those criteria. So there have to be some kind of a compromise there. And of course, in addition to that, uh, there is a lot uh, uh, additional required uh, technologies or uh, costs that one has to uh, have in order to uh, make use of the, those quantum systems. For example, <clears throat> one has to has a very low temperatures like to produce superconducting or to trap the ions, cold atoms, vacuums and clean rooms, or so, uh, some of the physical system are very difficult control. So overall, uh, there are, if you want to summarize that, uh, there are overall basically maybe two types of uh, challenges here. The first one is it's very tricky and very hard to make a quantum system that satisfy all of those criteria, and the second one is 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 a, is a challenge about money. So you have to spend a lot of money on that in order to improve lots of, uh, of those uh, conditions and technologies and to meet those criteria. So those are the main challenges right now. So the main question, and me and my group here is trying to ask is uh, whether there is any alternative system that can serve the sa same purpose, but uh, not quantum. So, so before I answer this question, uh, I just want to show a little bit uh, uh, what's the essential attributes that's needed uh, for quantum information science. So as we all know that the basic element in quantum information science is called a qubit. So everything is built uh, based on a qubit. So it, it's a two-stage system, zero and one, but it's just not a number. It's, it's not like uh, the, uh, uh, for the classical computer case, uh, it's not a number, but rather it's a, it's a vector. So you can imagine this, it lives in a two-dimensional space here. It has a uh, zero uh, axis and one axis. So that's a two-dimensional space. Uh, Physically, uh, uh, all those quantum physicists have been studying uh, to represent this uh, uh, concept of qubit is, for example, people use photon, use its polarizations has two states to represent this qubit. Uh, electron spins uh, also has two states, spin up and spin down, to represent the qubit, or a two-level atom, for example, but there are many more. So the second uh, essential key attributes uh, for quantum information computation is that uh, also Igor has mentioned uh, uh, in his talk that uh, some qubit properties. First one is called superposition. So not just a single vector of zero and one, but rather you have to have an arbitrary superposition of those two vectors, and then it represents an arbitrary vector in this two dimensional space. And the second one, of course, is called uh, entanglement about these qubits, uh, uh, more than just one qubit, but just uh, two or more qubits uh, to live in this, uh, to, to be in a quantum state looks like this. And this is actually an entangled state. So those, uh, uh, the key major attributes or properties that the uh, quantum information science need from a system, from a real physical system, so let's take a look at whether there's any analog of uh, such similar properties that exist uh, beyond the quantum system. So we talk about a classical optical beam here. 
it's usually written in such a form that's electromagnetic wave actually. So this little X has a hat, Y has a hat, that's a polarization. And the E, X, E, Y of T and uh, uh, R and T, that's actually just a function of space and time. So the electromagnetic wave is, is a wave function of space and time. So that's, that's an optical wave, an optical beam actually. So let's look at the first essential element that needed for quantum information. It's called a qubit. So the qubit actually, is, uh, the, the two dimensional uh, vector structure also exists in, in such a classic opt optical beam here, the light polarization, it has two dimensions, also horizontal and vertical polarization. And, and also for other degrees of freedom of, a, uh, of light, for example, it's spatial mode. Uh, in principle, it's infinite dimensional, but you can pick only two, uh, two states from that uh, spatial mode space. That forms another two dimensional subsystem. And uh, there are many other uh, degrees of freedom from the optical light, for example, temporal mode or phase or, or the uh, infinite number spatial mode within that you can create a lot more other the two state systems. So it has somehow some of those two state systems in this classical system. And for the second essential element for quantum information is, is called superposition here. Uh, and of course, superposition also exists in a classical wave system. You have different uh, oriented polarizations. You have different orientation of your spatial modes. So that's superposition. And of course, uh, the most important thing here is called entanglement. And we also, uh, as uh, recent studies in the, in the emerging fields uh, of called, uh, of, uh, that study the entanglement property in optical fields, showed that the uh, entanglement also uh, exists in those classical optical systems and that's a field called classical entanglement. So it seems like in, in such an optical system it, uh, it carries uh, some of the key properties uh, issue uh, attributes that's needed also in, in quantum information. So, so this uh, is really the, the motivation of, the field <coughs> of the, this new field here. Uh, we have done an experiment several years ago that uh, used a, a classical optical field that's entangled uh, to violate the Bell inequality. So you don't have to know what's the Bell inequality, but it, what it says is that if you observe a Bell violation, it's a witness the existence of entanglement. So, so for the classical optical beam, this is sort of a proof that the existence of a classical entanglement and of course, not only uh, the, the existence of a classical entanglement, uh, we have also shown that uh, such entanglement actually connects to a more fundamental issue of uh, both quantum and classical called wave particle duality. So it, when it add, uh, connects waveness and arrayness and adds up with classical entanglement, you get a identity relation. So, so that's a more fundamental role uh, that uh, we have discovered that uh, entanglement has uh, played uh, in those fundamental issues. And in the, uh, in the application side, such kind of uh, uh, classical optical superposition and classical optical entanglement has been used uh, uh, for optical sensing and metrology uh, uh, used to detect uh, objects flying into some uh, a region and uh, uh, in a very efficient and, uh, and a very sensitive way. So that was also several years ago. Uh, and and about, uh, around the same time, people have used uh, done experiments to use such analog of a classical system to do something called a tele teleportation, which uh, we know that in quantum information, one of the amazing uh, uh, tasks is called teleportation. So classically, one can do something similar not exactly the same, of course. Uh, using the idea of entanglement that's highlighted here in this state, that's kind of an entangled state in the classical system, but to, to kind of uh, uh, teleport some information from the optical beam, which is the radio information here, to the polarization uh, <clears throat> degrees of freedom uh, of that optical beam. And there are many more other uh, applications that, for example, this group uh, three years ago, they have 
used a classically entangled state to simulate a, a quantum channel. So uh, it's, it's an emerging field right now. It's just trying to uh, seek in the connections between uh, classical and quantum and see whether there is anything uh, special uh, that can be done. Uh, and of course, in the future, uh, particularly, uh, it's the focus of, uh, of uh, my group here at Stevens is uh, we want to make use of those similarities, not just only to explore those fundamental features, uh, but also to, to explore the, uh, the feasibility of using such features to, to do or to realize uh, some quantum computational jobs, uh, like to building up at least from the beginning of some uh, quantum logical gates. So this plot really shows in it with a classical optical beam has uh, polarization and spatial modes, you can use those uh, uh, optical devices, which is very, uh, very uh, uh, common in, in optics labs. Uh, to build uh, what is called in quantum computation called Hadamard gate or control knot gate. Eventually you can uh, build uh, to create from a separable state to an entangled state. And, and of course control knot gate and Hadamard gate can do a lot more things than just this. So the hope of course is, uh, and the goal uh, of this group, our group is, is to make use of these features of superposition and entanglement to eventually to simulate or emulate uh, some of those quantum computational jobs. So the answer to the question that I raised earlier, uh, my answer to that is that uh, for certain tasks is yes, because there's lots of similarities in the analog uh, behaviors of the classical system uh, that were uh, that that's uh, similar so those quantum systems and those properties are actually uh, the exact essential element that's needed for quantum information and quantum computation. And in addition to that, for a classical optical system, for example, it has some uh, advantages in terms of, for example, robustness, uh, it, it's low cost, it's easy to manipulate and it's efficient, of course. Uh, so uh, comparing to those quantum systems, um, so that's sort of a, a actually an emerging field of research that uh, uh, people are trying uh, to, to explore the possibility of using those properties to implement uh, some of the quantum information and quantum computation tasks. And uh, this is a cartoonish uh, plot that we uh, uh, wrote some years ago for Optics and Photonics News. Uh, the upper left is a classical world and, uh, uh, and the lower right is the quantum world. So we are sort of focusing here at the overlapping zone here between quantum and classical. And not only uh, to apply some of those ideas of quantum information with uh, classical systems, but also uh, uh, to explore and to fundamentally understand better what is quantum and what is classical uh, by uh, by exploring this overlapping zone. So it's, okay. it has both, uh, okay, uh, okay, practical great. and uh, fundamental applications. I'll, I'll just, just, that's the last slide. So hopefully uh, there's something in the end called quantum classical, uh, classical quantum information can be realized. So thank you all. I'll be happy to receive any questions. Okay, uh, great. Thank you so much. Shafon, and uh, unfortunately, we don't have time uh, for verbal Q&A Q now. So if you have any question, please uh, type in the chat and uh, Shafon will answer them.